But today it's my privilege to be um, talking to Al Harberger, who was my colleague when I first came to Chicago in the uh, early to mid-80s. And of course, he's had a very distinguished career uh, along a, a variety of fronts. Um, the first question I'd like to ask is, you know, you've had a remarkable career in the sense you've made substantive contributions in the fields of public finance, development. At the same time, you've had important influences in the conduct of economic policy in a variety of places, including Chile and elsewhere. How have you found fundamental insights from economics to be valuable in the policy arena? Well, let me start with uh, explaining my own definition of the Chicago School of Economics, uh, which uh, many people uh, have a picture of economics which is uh, very one-sided and built really around Milton Friedman, whom I revere, but is, is not the whole Chicago school. My definition covers pretty much all the people who were my colleagues in 38 years on the faculty, and it has three principles. Number one, the world is an exceedingly complicated place. It is so complicated that we can never truly fathom it. And we, in order to get anywhere with the world, we absolutely need to have a theory that will sort of pull things together. Now, many people can have theories that are far in the stratosphere, but are they useful? Chicago has a test. How useful are they in helping us understand the real world in the first place, and maybe even use the theory to help us deal with the world, maybe predict and choose policies. Mm -hmm. So that is the story. Uh, now, when this real world uh, orientation, one of the biggest things one needs is diagnostics. And to me, one of the, it's very unfortunate that we don't have courses in diagnostics mm -hmm. to try to read the tea leaves of the world in a serious way and have meaning for policy. But in the absence of courses in diagnostics, courses in the fundamentals are absolutely necessary. And that was the essence of Chicago. No frills, lots of fundamentals. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, what we were able to do using fundamentals is you can get distillations of the world that can make uh, sense, you simple distillations of the world, and you know they're going to be wrong sometime, and you therefore have always to have your eye open to something coming from left field or right field or something else, and being able to adapt your simple explanation to accept these comets from uh, outer space, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so we have to be open to shifts from other forces that are non-systematic. The core curriculum at Chicago has been something that has been very intense, and I think in many respects special relative to other graduate programs. But I also agree with you, having taught econometrics for many years, that kind of struggle with a part of econometrics about how to use models in sensible ways and thoughtful ways. You know, it's not like how to put standard errors and, and, and fancy statistics on things, but how to really use them in insightful ways. So it, it's, it's an incredibly important skill, and it's, and it's hard to teach, I, fi I find, but I think it's really critical to, I'm glad to hear it's, that, that you view this as kind of central to the uh, uh, Ch Chicago way of thinking. So you spent decades at the University of Chicago by, surrounded by other distinguished economists and actually actively engaged in the training of students, which has been really quite remarkable. Um, looking back, what do you see as the most memorable aspects of this experience? What unique aspects in this intellectual environment were most critical in the training of future economic policymakers in Latin America and elsewhere? Well, if I have to say in two words what makes Chicago such a great university it is think big. <laughs> yeah. That Absolutely. Little trivial things have never been important at yeah. Chicago. Uh -huh. What are the big things that are important? And uh, 
as a kind of a point of reference, I had 38 years on the faculty at Chicago. We interviewed hundreds of candidates and discussed them in department meetings. I can't remember a single time when a colleague in such a department meeting brought up the question, how many articles does he have in refereed journals? And I have been in other places where that's yeah. common every single time a, th a, a, a thing comes up. Yeah. Now, I see what that does is giving the vote to the referees of journals yeah. when we know how hard it is for journal editors to find a referee and how there are often people not even in the right field and goodness knows what. Uh, I like much better the question of how many citations does a person have because citations in, in, indicate influence on the rest of the profession. But the rest of the profession is not as good as the faculty at Chicago. <laughs> so what is the true thing? What have I learned from what this candidate has written? What has he contributed to me? And that, I believe, has been the single most important criterion by which Chicago people have done this. And speaking to a Nobel Prize winner and all of that, Chicago has more Nobel Prizes than anybody else. But in my time in Chicago, the total faculty never numbered more than 25. Yeah. While all our competitors had faculty of 50, 60 and more and getting less Nobel Prizes. So a final comment on yeah. this, exposure to the brave makes you brave. The idea of sitting in class with all these luminaries who have made great contributions and innovations and showed you how to go off from a standard track mm -hmm. and build a path which then others will follow, mm -hmm. that that very experience makes the student more willing and able to do similar things in the future. As you've had a front row seat in watching economic policy implemented in Latin America uh, countries, sometimes in adverse ways, sometimes in good ways, what do you see as the important lessons going forward for the success of the economies, uh, um, of these Latin American economies or economies worldwide? What, are, what have been the key factors of successes? What are the big, biggest contributions to the failures? Well, uh, I wrote an article, a while. I, I, my first trip to Latin America was on July 1st, 1955, when I arrived here yeah. on a University of Chicago mission. Uh, so I've been around Latin America for an awful long time. And uh, it is very clear to me that good economics has come to Latin America. Not to all of them, uh -huh. there are plenty bad actors even today, a few anyway, but the general grade of economic policy in Latin America has gone up dramatically and the main reason why that is true is the well-trained professionals have been more and more involved in the process. Mm -hmm. and. Not only are they well trained, but I think also important. On the whole, they have been observant of events and sensitive to what was going on. Yeah. Uh, now, the big bane in Latin America, which you can see today in Venezuela, uh, is populism. And populism sometimes can have, a, for people, a certain plus overtone. But in economics, in Latin America, it doesn't. It means promising what you cannot deliver yeah. and getting power on the basis of those promises. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, the, the tough story. Good economics focuses on the delivery mechanisms. Think of what instruments you have at your disposal 
what you can move, what is possibility, what is the cost of using this instrument, what are the benefits of using this instrument, and working that way, sensitively going back and forth from what you see as a problem, and what you have in your hand, and what it is useful for, that's the way Chicago economics, and good economics in general, has worked in Latin America when it has succeeded. What accomplishments now give you the most pride in retrospect? Well, number one, I have to tell you the story of how I ever got to Chicago on the faculty. Uh, in 1950 and 51, President Truman had named a President's Materials Policy Commission called the Paley Commission uh, because with the outbreak of the Korean War, materials prices had shot through the roof, multiplying sometimes by three, four, five, and they were worried about that. And this commission worked for nearly two years, and uh, I had the job of making a projection of materials demand in 1975, roughly 25 years ahead, mm -hmm. for everything from antimony to zinc but including all of the important ones like coal, natural gas, oil, et cetera. Uh, so I did my job and luckily I was, my name was attached to my chapter, which was the only chapter in the seven volumes that had a name. Uh -huh. Who read this chapter was T.W. Schultz. <laughs> <laughs> and Chicago was looking for somebody in public finance at that time, very desperately, because Roy Blau had moved to Washington to the Council of Economic Advisors, and they had a complete vacancy there. And uh, so T.W. reads my projection to 1975 of materials demand, and he says, this is our man for public <laughs> finance. <laughs> and not only does he say it, but he convinces his colleagues that that is the right thing. Uh -huh. So I was drafted into public finance by T.W. Schultz, reading my 1975 <laughs> projections. What did he see in that? He saw real world economics. Mm -hmm. Because the most key thing about the method of projection was it wasn't making a bunch of regressions going back to the what? The post-war inflation, <laughs> the, the war, the depression. Mm -hmm. This was what we had in the past. Yeah. You couldn't work for 75 working on that. Yeah. I've had to build a picture of the 1975 economy yeah. with population, per capita income, labor force, mm -hmm. households, how big a stock of housing, how big a stock of cars, replacement demands for housing and cars, growth demands for these things, mm -hmm. and working back then to the input-output needs for different materials and so on. And I'm sure, even though he never told it to me, <laughs> that that real-world aspect yeah. of my chapter was the thing that really applied to Schultz. Yeah. I have a kind of a second story about that, that when I first arrived in Chicago, they were just going through the motions of seeking money from Rockefeller Foundation for Milton Friedman's workshop. Mm -hmm. T.W. Schultz had money for the Ag Seminar already, yeah. but what did he do? He grafted on a public finance workshop with it. Mm -hmm. without, almost without my knowledge. I mean, he told me he was doing yeah. it after he did it, but uh, this was another uh, demonstration of the faith that T.W. had in me, mm -hmm. and uh, you ask why, what, what made me <laughs> happy <laughs> and proud. <laughs> well, that's a part of the story. Uh, now, but over my whole lifetime, my biggest pride, without any conceivable doubt, is with my students, more so than anything and everything that I have ever written. Uh, and uh, they, my students have done so much. A couple have been presidents of the American Economic Association. A couple have got Nobel Prizes. Uh, many, uh, several more are in the uh, are, are fellows of the, the 
uh, National Academy of Sciences, many more of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and so on. So on that level. And then worldwide, I'm pushing 50 ministers of state and more than 15 presidents of central banks and so on. So I have huge pride in all that. Uh, but within all of this, I have so many students and so on, uh, when people ask me, what about your training at Chicago? I think of myself, I'm a Friedman student. I'm a T.W. Schultz student. I'm a Marshak student. Because they are the ones that changed my life. Uh -huh. And the fact that, the thing that really gets me about fact is that so many of my students, when they name their three favorite professors and so on, what kind of, whose student are they that they choose to name my name by their own volition? That is more important than any count of any kind. Mm 